Hello and welcome back to the chop. Happen over the next five, ten years. All that means is we're starting at one, and you need to incentivize them to mine the blocks. Six thousand eight hundred dollars for one terabyte for two different If enough nodes say we don't want to have this content, then okay, it's going to be kind of rare in the network, right? Okay, hello and welcome back to the chop. It is hot outside and we are about to deliver some hot information. Uh, we are back dissecting it up, chopping it up and doing a deep dive on blockchain protocols. Today's blockchain protocol is none other than our weave. We've got a very special guest, uh, Tony, on the line. Obviously, our, our co-host, uh, Ninja T. And obviously, the main host of the show, none other than Saint Jerome, Mr. Ashley Pierre. Yes, sir. Uh, so this is uh, episode four of The Chop. Quick disclaimer before we get started. Disclaimer, all content is for education, information, and entertainment purposes only. Ha, ha, ha. No information should be considered investment advice or a financial recommendation to buy, sell any assets, nor place any trades. Please always do your own research. research. It is very important to do your own analysis before doing any or making any investments based on your own individual circumstances. Always take independent professional advice from a professional advisor or independently research and verify all and any information you may find in our content. Do you wish to rely upon whether you wish to, wish to make an investment decision or otherwise? All investments come with something called risk. Please always do your own research. <laughs> we are not financial advisors. Tony, you're not a financial advisor, are you? No, sir. No, there we go. Um, neither is Ashley, a.k.a. St. Jerome, myself, or Mr. Harding. Uh, and we do not intend to be perceived or received as financial advisors. However, we are working in collaboration with several... several accredited advisors not just one not just two but several so if you are unable to mitigate your risk then please contact us immediately so we can refer you to an accredited advisor send us an email at hello at blockchainsensei.com or just send us a dm on twitter or instagram and just say i need a financial advisor and someone from the team will get you will uh, put you in touch with a financial advisor as soon as possible um so i'm gonna let the main host of this show St. Jerome take over and talk to us about, uh, we'll introduce our special guest and talk about what we're, going to, what we're going to be talking about this episode of The Chop, where we break down individual assets. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Let me know if you can see that. Mm, yep. Okay, cool. Okay, so... Welcome to the chop episode four. It's been just over a month, I believe, since the last chop episode. And today we're going to be going over AR Weave. And today I've invited a special guest to the program, Mr. Tony. Um, me and Tony have had quite a lot of in depth um, discussions about blockchain technology. And he is the person that actually first introduced AR Weave to me. Uh, mid to late 2021 and so I thought since I'm doing a chop episode on it let me invite Tony so I'll just let Tony introduce himself and then we'll get on to the chop. It's a pleasure and a privilege Ash thanks. Um, so yeah my name's Tony uh, I normally work under the name Ouija so uh, I'm not very vocal on on uh, social but you can find me at, um, at 0xouija so Ouija um, and mostly I work within DeFi um, and governance spe like specialization. So all the protocols uh, rolling around through Ethereum is where I'm based mostly. I have drifted from chain to chain, but I mostly exist within that sphere. And, uh, and our weave is a pivotal part of that. It's a pivotal part of maintaining kind of a permanent data structure um, to back up all your needed hyperlinks and et cetera. So it's, it's something that's very, very important. I write a lot. Um, and I have a mirror, and are we plugs to that too? So short and sweet, but that's where I operate. Okay, that's amazing. So AR weave. So AR weave can be seen as a low cost, permanent, 
high throughput storage on a new blockchain. So by the end of this lecture, if you don't know already, you should know more about what that is. It's a low cost, high throughput, permanent storage solution on a new blockchain. So before we get into that exactly, I'm just going to go through the agenda for today. So first we're gonna have a look at the problem that AR we seek to solve, why it's thought on a blockchain and the different current methods of doing it. Then we're just gonna briefly have a look at some brief key points from the white paper, light paper and yellow paper. Then we're gonna have a look at the funding in the top, we always have a look at the funding to find out where the pieces of the pie are coming from. And then we're going to have a look at AR Weave itself. So you can basically break down AR Weave as being a combination of two parts. One part is a new mining system and one part is a sustainable endowment. They come together to make AR Weave. And then the PermaWeb is built on top of AR Weave, which is consisted of the new mining system and a sustainable endowment. So we're gonna have a look at that. So now within the new mining system itself, you have a block weave, proof of access, block shadowing and wildfire. So we're gonna go into all those four points in more detail, those four technologies in more detail. And after that, we're gonna have a little look at building on the permaweb, tools, gateways, uh, GraphQL, smart weave, just go into that a tiny bit, not too much. And then we're going to have more of an in-depth look at projects using AR Weave. There is loads and it's actually much bigger than I actually initially thought this project. And then we're going to have a look at some risks, new developments and future proof. Then we're going to end with a conclusion. So I'm just going to say another disclaimer before we start. This report has been prepared solely for informative purposes and should not be the basis for making investment decisions or be construed as a recommendation to engage in investment transactions or to be taken to suggest an investment strategy with respect to any financial instrument or the issues thereof. Okay, so why would we want to store a document on chain and what are the current ways of doing it? So AR Weave as a protocol is being used for very similar reasons to why a blockchain is actually used. So when we look at the reasons why blockchains are used, they're used because they're tamper resistant, they're visible, and they um, have a, they, what's the word? They comfort a need for decentralization. They meet that requirement, right? So tamper resistant. So documents have hashes. When the hash of a document changes uh, on a blockchain, that's gonna get rejected essentially because a blockchain is a distributed ledger of mined blocks which consists of transactions, right? So now those transactions, each one is unique. So you have a document, it has a hash. You open, change that document, the hash changes. When you try to put that on the blockchain, it's gonna be rejected because each node that has a history of the same transactions realizes that document's being tampered with, right? So it's tamper resistant. And it's visible because that ledger is an open ledger. Anybody can have a node from across the world and on their nodes, they have a full history, if they choose so, of that specific blockchain. So they can see the history of it. And that's why it's visible, which also leads into the third point. These visible histories of the ledgers are not in a centralized hand. It's not like Amazon web server, or it's not like Dropbox where it's contained by one entity. It's open source. So these nodes, these visible nodes across the world are not contained by one single entity, right? Then you can get into 51% attacks from there, where actually you could argue that it's less decentralized, but then that would cost a lot of money to carry out. Or, and then there's actually techniques now such as proof of stake where they lower the chance of a 51% attack. Why? Because you're owning majority of the stake of that. So you're essentially putting your, your assets at risk from you're devaluing your own assets, right? So when we look at different methods of storing on the chain, 
So a lot of projects say on-chain storage. So what they actually mean is that they're storing the hash on-chain as opposed to the entire document. So I don't know if people know already, but on Bitcoin and Ethereum, you can actually store full documents on-chain, right? In the Genesis block of Bitcoin, there's actually a message in there, 2009, and it's related to the financial crisis. It says something about the chancellor um, of the exchequer. So well, existing methods are not really feasible. So for example, Bitcoin, the maximum um, storage size you can have is one MB, right? And then a method of actually storing a method on Bitcoin is using hexadecimal encryption. So when you use hexadecimal encryption, you then can't actually use your Bitcoin for its intended purpose. So then it would cost, say, what's the current price of Bitcoin, say 20 grand or $20,000 to send a message. So it's just not feasible. And plus, well, there's another way of doing it. You can have, you can put the message encoded in on hash, right? But then still it's limited to one MB and you still have to run it through encryption, such as SHA-256, right? Now, Ethereum, it's got a theoretical unlimited block size. So you can actually store an Ethereum much more easily. However, due to the gas fees on Ethereum, actually storing an entire document is really not feasible on Ethereum. But I just mentioned those two points just to say that it actually is possible to store entire documents on current blockchains using existing methods. So now when we look at current projects that actually um, utilize on-chain storage, it's important we make a distinguish. We distinguish because they are actually not storing the entire document on chain. They are actually just storing the hash on chain. So we have to do due diligence when we look at projects that say they're doing on chain storage. And those projects, such as Seacoin, StoreJ, and Filecoin, right? So they're actually renting out unused hard drive (HDD) from people from nodes all across the world, and then they're using those unused hard drive spaces to store the actual content on them. But then on-chain is just the hashes stored of the documents, right? So then as I said before about the tamper resistance and visibility points, those hashes are then on-chain, which is theoretically protecting the documents from um, being exposed or from being tampered with, because once their hashes are changed, the blockchain is gonna actually reject them, right? So the, those projects, Seacoin, StoreJ, Filecoin, they're utilizing on-chain storage, but it's not actually storing the documents on-chain, right? And then we have solutions such as Skynet Labs. So Skynet Labs is actually built on Seer, and it's built using existing IPFS interplanetary file system. We'll talk about more about that later, but um, it's actually built on existing... Skynet builds on the existing IPFS technology, right? However, from my understanding, Skynet Labs as it's built on Sia, it's still utilizing on-chain hash storage. It's not actually storing the actual document online on-chain. Then we come to ICP internet computer. So if you were to look for a competitor of AI Weave, if that's the way you want to see it, um, it would be ICP, it would be IPFS because, um, sorry, no, not IPFS. Talk more about that later. It would, I, it would be ICP because ICP is building a decentralized internet in which you can run web free apps on it. And the actual, I still actually don't think the entire document is stored online. And I've been searching to find out, but I've not come across any literature. So if anybody knows, they can leave it in the comment. But from my understanding, it's the closest thing to AR Weave at the moment in the sense of it's decentralized, just like the rest but they have something called canisters and the document is actually stored within the canisters which is online so um from my understanding that means document is on chain but as i say if anybody knows more information about that let me know but that's the most closest project i've identified to AI weave okay. so looking at the white paper so AI weave has a white paper a light paper and a yellow paper. So Sam Williams is the co-CEO and sorry, he's the co-founder and current, current CEO 
of Airweave, and he was a PhD candidate in decentralized computing or a similar type of studies. And I've just broken down three points from the white paper, and I'll expand on those, and I will link it to um, some new knowledge base within the project. So I'll just read this out. So the internet has also revolutionized the way that journalists interact with their readers. Where once we would hold a physical and irrevocable copy of the news, we now simply access the information and discard it. So that's very true. If you think back even just to recent days, 20 years ago, we would physically have like a newspaper. And then if say the media changed the narrative, we would still have a copy of the old narrative, whether good or bad, we would still have a copy of it. But nowadays, um, as the most things are done online, news websites updated every day. So if the narrative changes, you're just gonna get rooted to that direct URL and you're gonna see the latest story that the news put out. So we've actually lost the ability to have that old ledger, that old copy of the news. However, there is actually a current solution. There's something called the Wayback Machine. I don't know if anyone's heard of this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. You can go to like old web pages and see what things used to look like, right? Exactly. <laughs> oh, you can see. I need to turn off my life. <laughs> um, right. So, yeah, so you can. So, actually, that's a web two solution, right? So, Internet Archive have a Wayback machine where you can actually go and put in an old URL and look at the website at that uh, moment in time. However, there a lot of effort goes into archiving of that it's not done automatically you have to go and save websites and then even when they're saved they're still hosted on centralized servers like aws amazon web server right so what i find interesting is that internet archive the co the founder of that is actually working with ar weave so where some people might see a threat or where some people might see um collusion and say okay we need to be better than them no, no, the CEO of Internet Archives done interview with the CEO, Sam Williams of um, AR Weave. So it's interesting to see at that higher level how they both know and realize that not just going to be one solution to this um, issue of data permanence and how they're actually willing to work together. So currently, Internet Archive, they're actually working to store all of their data on AR Weave to have the permanence there. Second point I highlighted, so through a distributed consensus system, the information associated with a internet URL is verified prior to entry onto the AR chain. Then once the document is stored on the block weave, it is cryptographically linked with every other block and document on the weave. This ensures that any attempt to change the contents of the document will be detected and rejected by the network. In this way, no subversion of the information is possible. So what that's saying is every document or entry of content onto the AR weave is connected to everything else. So like a weave, like a web. So we're gonna get more into the block weave ah, later. That's why they're called it our weave. That's it, right? So it's a weave that's interconnected. Therefore, like if that. you exactly therefore, if you change one aspect of it, like change, like before with the hash example, it's just gonna get rejected because it's a weave, right? And this also allows for better sharding techniques such as block shadowing which i will talk about later but the point i wanted to highlight here is just that everything is connected to each other therefore any attempt to change the contents of the document will be detected and rejected by the network and on to the final point wait let me just make sure i'm understanding here yes sam williams is the creator of are we yeah and this has been around since 2017. Correct. Damn. So the white paper came out in 2017. The ICO ended in 2018. I just got confirmation yesterday. I asked in the Telegram group because I've seen different, different dates since 2020. But um, someone replied saying, actually, the ICO ended in 2018. Um, and they've just been building from then. Um, they did the last major upgrade in 2021. Which do, you know if, do you know if they went through a pre-seed and seed round? They did, yeah. I'll come on to that so oh. very soon. Um, they went through a few, about seven funding rounds. Six. Wait, seven. seven funding rounds prior to ICO? 
Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, you can do that because you you seed round. You can kind of some companies are very cheeky on it, and they'll do. Oh, them one part two, part three. Yeah. <laughs> just keep raising. Just keep raising. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, just the last point I want to make from the white paper. So, any browser with the AI chain extension installed will be able to seamlessly navigate between pages stored on servers and on the normal internet and resources stored in the AI chain. Now, since this is 2017, I believe you don't actually even need the AI chain extension now to actually access AI. We've, if you just put in, say, this link, sam.ai, we've got dev in your URL bar, right? You're gonna just get rooted to that now. So you'll know it's on AI Weave because the URL is AI Weave. Um, that the working on solutions where you can actually have custom URLs. But yeah, since this is from 2017, I believe that's outdated. Somebody can um, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. But however, you still, from my understanding, you still do need the AI chain extension if you want to add a web page to the permanent history on AI Weave. So like use it like the Wayback Machine using AI Weave's um, inbuilt permanence. If you want to add a web page or app, the app or whatever you're browsing on the internet to the AI chain history, then you would actually need the extension then. But if you just want to browse the AI Weave, you just do it like normally now. I think this technology is amazing for legal contracts. I was yeah. going to say, so off that, off Michael just said there, so I've worked with a lot of DAOs, um, especially within policy. Um, and there is a real problem with IPs being changed and being able to backtrack mm -hmm. and having that in permanent or kind of risk factor is a really big thing, right? You'll find that a lot of projects will probably start to lean to towards this sort of thing where you've got built in redundancies um, for a permanent kind of backup storage for documentation, be it IPs or otherwise. Another thing is contracts and things like that. And can they be enforced? Um, so that's that's something else which you might see become more of a thing later on in, in crypto through uh, governance and accountability networks. So yeah, big thing, big, big thing. Nice. Yeah, definitely. Building on from what Tony just said, I actually read an article the other day and it said something like up to 40% of web links used in court cases are actually not there, they disappeared. Yeah. So like, <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Whoa, whoa, that is so crazy. It makes sense. So what solicitors and lawyers have started doing now is screenshotting before their court cases, screenshotting the evidence. Lawyers, they, screenshot your evidence. Anybody that's the point so of failure. Funny. Imagine you go there, you're there in the courtroom, and if we can just upload this link, please, and then it's just not there. Yeah, it's. And it's everyone's really like the 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 guilty the guilty person's just like, well, I don't know, I don't know what happened, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. So then you see why uh, projects such as AI Weave, um, well, yeah, they are great in that sense. There is obviously some risks about AI Weave as well, but I'll come on to those later. So the light paper. Um, just go over three uh, points I've highlighted again from the light paper and then expand on them just to give some the new knowledge some context. So typical blockchains have several major well-known problems with data storage. These problems require new third-party protocols to be integrated on top of existing blockchains as fees are too high for on-chain storage to be feasible. Therefore, with typical blockchains, there is always going to be a cost to access content and content is never stored permanently. As the demand for data storage grows exponentially, the need for a decentralized, low-cost data storage protocol that can scale is a necessity. So the key point I want to take out from this is, do, 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 I want to be, what point did I want to make with this now? These uh, typical blockchain seven. Yeah, so as the demand for data storage grows exponentially, the need for a decentralized, low-cost data storage protocol that can scale is necessary is a necessity so with ar weave the more data in the actual network the less mining power ultimately it uses in order to recover that data so it's actually net positive it's based on proof of work proof of access so it, it does use mining power but unlike bitcoin unlike typical bitcoin blockchain proof of work 
um, with proof of access, which is built on proof of work. The larger the network, the larger it's weaved, actually there's gonna be more recall blocks. So I'll talk about recall blocks in a bit, but a recall block allows the, the next block to be mined. So now the more nodes that have more recall blocks means that there's gonna be less computing power needed to mine the next block, reducing in a more latency, or is it lower latency? I believe lower latency, more throughput, right? So that's an interesting point. I believe latency, lower the latency, the, the more the pressure, so the yeah. more. Low latency, high throughput. That's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the next point I wanted to make, as the amount of data stored in the system increases, the amount of hashing needed for consensus decreases, thus reducing the cost of storing data. So I more or less just covered that point there. And then the last point, once the document is stored on the weave, it is cryptographically linked with every other block on the weave. And I covered this point from the white paper. So just a few um, points repeating themselves there, but the more it repeats, the more one can get an understanding of how it works. You know what, just as a complete side note, Yeah. I think this is the first time I've seen light paper spelled like this. Light paper. It's usually oh, yeah. -E. But it's I just but I just Googled it yeah. and this is how they spell it. How do you see it spelled? L I T E paper. Wow. Okay. Mr. Hardin, have you ever seen light paper written like this? Oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe he's occupied right now. Okay. No, no, I, I thought I, I've seen both, but I thought it was just me being dyslexic. No, nah, no, nah, like I, I've only ever seen it light paper, L I T. Oh, that's interesting. So, just another paper, just the last one. Okay, so the yellow paper is a paper that's a lot more technical, it goes into actual equations. Um, which is quite interesting. Every time I see an equation, I feel like falling asleep. Um, I think I've seen a lot of equations in my life. Um, so now wait, I have to- Wait, 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 let's just put some context on this. Uh, Ashley has a master's in aerospace engineering, and he also used to work for the European Space Station in Cologne in Germany, which is like the NASA of Europe. So if there's somebody that understands maths to a high level, it's him. Oh, thank you for that. I just want to clarify, it's a bachelor's I got, not a master's. I'd, I received a scholarship for a master's, but I declined it in order to go to Germany. For the oh, I thought, you, I thought you finished your master's. You didn't do one? No. This whole time I'm telling everyone you got a master's. <laughs> no, 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 no. Bachelor's, <laughs> mate. But then I got, a, actually got a, just off track for a second, I actually got a master's scholarship by Scottish Power, uh, Energy Electrical Engineering. Um, so, yeah, I got a scholarship from them to do a master's. If anybody wants to offer uh, Ashley slash St. Jerome a scholarship, get in touch. He, um, he, he's accepting scholarship applications. You've got to apply to see if he wants your scholarship. Thank you. Thanks for the plug. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, so the yellow paper, all data required to process new blocks and new transactions is memoized into the state of each individual block. So again, this is talking about a new sharding technique. Um, sharding is essentially uh, the blockchain being split up across different nodes and not having to access the full history on each node because that takes a lot of, um, that reduces the throughput essentially. Imagine having 70% of information already, but when a new transaction comes through, having to start from 0% again, right? So when you're sharding, ETH2 is actually introducing sharding or ETH from are looking at sharding, I believe. So, um, yeah, the block, yeah. the block shadow, block shadowing that AI Weave is doing is, is a type of sharding, it's building on sharding. So instead of each block having to have the full history, each block only has a shadow, each block has the transaction list, full transaction list, the full wallet list, and another list as well, the full block list, amongst some more minor details. So with this information, a block, when a node is wants to mine a block, right, it doesn't have to go through the full history, it can just use that shadow in order to mine a block, 
right? Which again, is more energy efficient. And before it actually mines this block, it wants consensus on the block first in AR weave. So then that goes into what's called wildfire, which we'll talk about later, which uses game theory and nodes are ranked based on how they interact with each other. I know Tony can talk about game theory, you know, um, so that's, <laughs> that's an interesting one. Um, the yellow paper goes a lot into game theory, man, it goes way into that and it's interesting. So all data required to process new blocks and transactions in memoirs into the state of each individual block. Second point, with AI, we full synchronization is not a risk or obligation, but an optional upgrade path for which miners receive high rewards. So with Bitcoin proof of stake, like I just said, even if you have 70% of all the transactions existing on the Bitcoin, when a new transaction comes for the consensus, you have to start from zero, or maybe it's an arbitrary figure, but my point is that you have to have that full history each time. So you're just burning each time. A lot of the time, stuff you already know or you've already dealt with on your node, you have to do it again from the start, right? So, but with AR weave, um, nodes don't have to have that full history. Um, the more um, the more recall blocks you have, the more new blocks you can mine because in order to mine a new block, you need to have previous block and also the recall block. But you don't have to when you, if you want to set up a node now. You don't have to go through the full history. You can just get the current state of the network and then take it from there and then get recall blocks as they come along. So it depends. With AI, with this optional upgrading paths, you don't have to have the full blockchain history. So let's just break this down for an absolute newbie to, yep. to crypto or to, to blockchain technology. So to become a validator on the network, yep. Um, and to be able to be rewarded for doing so, yeah. you have to initially purchase um, or stake a certain amount of your Arweave token to get this initial block, right? No, so that would be proof of stake, but um, Arweave is proof of work. Okay, so you, you, you do it to get your... So, you, so how do you get your initial... Because you said that you have to get... You have to have a certain block to be able to uh, process other blocks transactions, right? Yeah. So is that when you are accepted by the network? Yeah, so to start your node, if you want to start your AR with node today, you just have to download the current state of the network, the current, you don't have to have the, histor the, the historical um, transaction. Oh, okay. So you can just literally start from any point. Yeah. Okay, so you start from any point. Um, do we have any costs on, do we know how much it costs to do that? Costs is just your energy power, so proof of work. Uh, so it's just the hardware and the, the mining, um, the, the GPU. Is it more GPU mining on this, you know, or CPU? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know. Okay, don't I'll know. look into that. Yeah, I don't even know really the difference between GPU and CPU. Mining, okay. So can I explain yeah. that? Um, so it's basically that's how the ASIC miners um, that um, used to mine Bitcoin uh -huh. used. So it was originally CPU mining, but it's basically where you use the framework of the GPU, the, of the graphical processing unit to mm -hmm. imitate what the CPU would be doing. So you can do, it can mine way faster and do way more. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's, it's basically like, not tricking. I'm trying to think of the most simple way of explaining this. It's, it's, it's using the graphical interface mm -hmm. to compute information mm -hmm. in a higher and larger way, causing less stress on the actual RAM. Mm -hmm. That's the best way of trying to break it down in as a lesser nerdy form as I can. Okay. I'm gonna, I think that's correct. I'm going to read into that. That sounds but yeah, look into GPU mining versus CPU mining and ASIC. How and why ASIC miners are used for mining Bitcoin. Okay. Well, I'm going to look into that. Thank you for that insight. Okay. Right. So on to the last point for the yellow paper. So 
In a traditional blockchain network, when a new block is mined, each entire block is distributed to every node in the network, no matter how many of the block transactions that the node already possesses. This significantly limits the amount of data that can be included in a block, as all of the data needs to be gossiped around the network during consensus. So that builds on from a point that I previously made. Uh, in a traditional network, the entire block is distributed to every other node, but in AR Weave, um, only the shadow is distributed to every other node. So with, I know with proof of work, uh, that's where, um, what's the word? Um, when the blockchain splits, what's that word? Hard fork. Yeah. yeah. I know that's where hard forks can occur because it's taken such a long time for this information to be passed everywhere within that time period can actually get a fork. Yeah, forks can occur in two different ways. Um, so you can have like a soft fork or a hard fork. Um, so this is like avoiding kind of a, a lesser, a smaller problem of a fork. You know, a real hard fork would be like um, Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash or Ethereum to Ethereum Classic, like big disagreements within governance. And then they split as a, as a result of a disagreement within a proposal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it kind of eliminates that in a sense or lowers the risk. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. So let's look at some funding now. So AR, we went through three, six, seven rounds of funding, total of $22 million um, over seven rounds. And it looks like, so I got told by somebody in the group that the ICO happened in 2018. But here they're saying that the seed rounds happened after the ICO as well. So I don't know if you can, once you've done your ICO, if you still can get funding rounds, I don't know how that would work. So I got this data from Crunchbase. Crunchbase is a really good website in terms of finding out funding. Love that website. Mm. Of projects. Um, in order to get more details, you need to use a paid version. Um, which I'm sure is worth it, but this is just taken from the free version. So as you can see in the different rounds, they had different numbers of investors. So what I want to do now is just look into some of these investors, and take a little dive into some more of them. So Andresine Horowitz, this one I'm highlighting here in orange, that is actually the same as... Jeez. Z. <laughs> These guys are everywhere. They've got the fingers in everywhere in crypto. Yeah. Uh huh. So, yes. So that's the same as A16Z Crypto. That's the name of their company. So when you see Andresine Horowitz, just know that's the same as A16Z Crypto. It's called Andresine Horowitz because that's the last name of two of their co founders. So, as we can see, um, Andresine Horowitz. Of A16Z crypto, they invested in one to three different rounds, from my understanding. Then we also have Multicoin Capital, which is a crypto um, VC, crypto venture capitalist fund, and also maybe a hedge fund, I believe, um, crypto hedge fund. And then we have Union Square Ventures, they invested in two rounds, I believe. and Union Square Ventures is an interesting one. When I looked into those, I found out they also have invested in Coinbase, early Twitter, SoundCloud, Etsy, Tumblr, DuckDuckGo, and MongoDB. This is just some of their portfolio, and they invested in all these great companies early. So it's almost like Union Square Ventures, no one they see some of that's revolutionary, because I would say all those websites are just named are revolutionary to an extent. In that you know twitter is changing the way we communicate soundcloud we have a lot of new artists etsy now is growing even more people selling tumblr is always being used to go apparently it's got really good privacy um yeah it is. Sick. that's it and mongodb i don't know too much about that but i've heard i've heard it and of course coinbase right so another investor in ar we early in their seed round was Coinbase Ventures. 
Uh, probably don't need to talk too much about those. Everybody knows Coinbase and Coinbase Venture is just an investment arm of Coinbase. Coinbase? I've never heard of Coinbase. Who are they? <laughs> 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 <Just>. <laughs> That's it. So, um, yeah, we have A16's A Crypto Again there. So we know that's the same as Andrew Sin Horowitz. Then we have FJ Syndicates. When I looked for them, their website seems to be down. So I don't know what happened to those. If anybody knows, they can drop a comment. Then we have Karnika Yashwant, who is the co-founder of Forward Protocol. Forward Protocol, it seems to be creating um, like an ICP, internet computer type project, like a decentralized web where you can build um, web free apps on top of it. And He's also the CEO of Utopian Capital. So I presume he invested in AIW through Utopian Capital, but maybe not. Okay. So what is AIW? So as I mentioned in the first slide, AIW is low cost, high throughput, permanent storage on a new blockchain. So in order to break that down, you can see AIW as being composed of four different things. So it's composed of proof of access, block shadowing, wildfire, and block weave. Now these four things in conjunction with this sustainable endowment, essentially that's what creates AI weave, the technology behind it. And then the permaweb is built upon that. So we're gonna have a look at each of these individually. So proof of access slash block weave. So, Miners provide a proof of access to all data in order to add new blocks. So in proof of work, each block contains information about the previous block and it's a chain. In proof of access, it works the same way. You need information about the previous block, but in addition to that, you need information about a random block, not the one before that, a random block, which is why it's called a weave because you're weaving through it, right? Each block is linked to two prior blocks. The previous block in the chain, as with traditional blockchain, as I just said, and a block from the previous history of the blockchain. So this random block from the history of the block weave of the blockchain, it's called the recall block, right? So as I said earlier, the more recall blocks you have, the more chance you're gonna be able to mine a new block, which is why it is proof of work because the more CPU or, or GPU power you have, then the more access blocks you're gonna have, right? But it's a build on proof of work because you need that recall block. So it's proof of access. So requiring proof of access inventor incentivizes storage as miners need access to random blocks from the block weave's history in order to mine new blocks and receive mining rewards. Okay, so this diagram um, explains it in a picture format. So imagine on the left-hand side, it's a blockchain. Imagine proof of work block, blockchain like Bitcoin. This blue block is the previous block, right? So imagine the three pickle hammer things at the bottom, they can be the same node or it can be three different nodes. It doesn't really matter, right? So you've got these nodes mining in order to get, to the, in order to mine the new block, the new block is not on the page. The new block is way above there. In order to mine that new block, you need the previous block, which is in the middle of the screen, this blue box, right? So the node is going through the previous block and it's the same color because it's the same concept before that you need the previous block and hence forth before each node it's different node you need the previous block before that right so now with ar weave i'd say to make this diagram a bit easier to understand i would say take this red block and imagine the first block in each hammer pickle is red as well so if you imagine that that first block is red, this first block is red, this first block is red, then it's gonna be the same as the blockchain on the other side. Each of these is just the previous block, right? So in order to mine the new block, 
which is off of the page, you need not just the previous block, which is the red. So imagine this red concept now is the same as the blue concept on the other side. You need something in addition. You need a recall block, which is this green block here. Now on the right hand side is as normal. Let's just see, assume it keeps changing color because the recall block is different every time. So a purple, light blue, orange, and each node or the same node when it's mining that new block. So the recall block is changing, hence the changing color. But just imagine that first block is red, right? Denoting that you need the same um, previous block. So that's the block we've. So block shadowing. So in a traditional blockchain network, when a block is when a new block is mined, each entire block is distributed to every node in the network, no matter how many of the blocks transactions that the node already possesses. So I touched on block shadowing a bit earlier. So in AR weave, as opposed to a traditional blockchain where the transaction list history, the state of the blockchain is distributed to every node in the network, no matter how many of the block transactions that that node already possesses, it might be 70, it might be 90%. We have to spend that energy again to, to, to get that full list, right? In AR, we were just using a block shadow. So a minimal block shadow is set between nodes, which allows peers to reconstruct a full block rather than transmitting the full block itself. So what's contained in that block ah, shadow? This is like, um, who is it that does this? Not Mina. Um, and they basically take a picture of, of the, the block instead of using the whole block. Who is it that does that? We've reviewed them. We've definitely discussed them. Oh, this is going to annoy me now. They take a say, picture. Say, say that again. Say that again. What are you There's someone about? that we've discussed before. I can't remember if it was on the chop. But they do something similar whereby instead of using the whole block and processing the whole block again, it basically takes a picture of it and then the picture takes a picture of the pic of 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 the other block inside of it, so it's just loads of small screenshots or snapshots of blocks rather than processing a whole block. Maybe it is Mina. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it might be Mina. Maybe that's how Mina works. Right? Did you say Mina takes a, a like a snapshot of the current state of every yeah, 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 block? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that sounds very similar. Is that basically what shadow blocking is or block shadowing? Yeah, so it's taking information, which mm -hmm. is more lighter, and it's distributing that information to the nodes, and it allows the reconstruction of any block in the blockchain history through that information instead of actually having to send that block. So mm -hmm. it uses the hash of the wallet list, the block hash list, and list of transaction hashes. These are the three main data sets that are sent in order to allow any node to reconstruct a full node. And this helps with the high throughput of the AR Weave network. Okay. So AR Weave uses something called Wildfire. So Wildfire is an implementation of a AIIA metagame. AIIA, Adaptive Interactive Incentive Agent. Jeez. Right, so touching on some game theory here. So each node in the AI Weave network ranks its peers based on two primary factors. So those two factors are the peers' generosity and the peers' responsiveness. So essentially, you need a way to know who to trust in the network in case there is foreign entities or bad players in the network. So as a result, they come up with a wildfire, which is an implementation of an AI metagame. And in wildfire, each node contains information on other nodes, and this information is split into generosity and responsiveness. So, yo, this is so mad. I don't know if any of you are, are followers of Genghis Khan, but this is similar to Genghis Khan's Kuratai model. So, like Genghis Khan had a like a, a political, like infrastructure where it meant that like you voted who got the 
you had like every village had like five people the only way you could move up the rankings is if you were voted by your group of 10 and then if your group of 10 voted for you to move up then the next group of 10 had to vote for you to move up and it was only based on your work ethic that people would be would vote you up so this is kind of similar so it's, it's mad how like these concepts so like the, the bitcoin one comes from the byzantine gen um generals problem so it's mad how like all these like modern technologies are coming from like bloody like 2000 old 2000 year old like game like theory it's mad yeah it's it's like the um i think that's like a, a meritocratic process it's quite quite an interesting one it's like your value is based off you know how good are you at doing your job how efficient yeah. are you like how popular are you as well because meritocratic can be on a social basis as well mm. so that's like big thing at the moment um so yeah for sure the other thing that um you mentioned was the game theory which was when you break down like the basic form of game theory which is like originally from a computer program right of uh, of certain personalities so there's like pavlov's dog right which is like nice yeah. to everyone yeah. You meet a bad actor and Pavlov's dog is still nice to the bad actor. It just exploits it over and over again. Mm -hmm. So Pavlov's dog, when surrounded by the Pavlov's dog, does a great job. They all do good, good things, right? Positive, positive sum game, right? Mm -hmm. So an infinite game, brilliant. But when you introduce a bad actor to the network, it exploits all Pavlov's dogs, right? So <laughs> um, it, it's just it's a shit show, right? It's bad. Um, but then if you have something called Firm But Fair, which is one of the programs that was initiated afterwards since this, Basically, it plays nice with other things that play nice with it. If you play badly, if you're a bad actor, it will deny you. Um, so it'll, it'll get exploited once and then it will deny. Um, and then it's like the way you can like build up its trust again, but it's a much more resilient positive sub game because there's always bad actors. So this is like taking advantage of that. So which is really good. That's like what you want to see, right? For sure. Mm, definitely. I like it. I like it. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And that links into the different um, strategies. So there's a DSIC, a dominant strategy incentive compatible. And on what Tony just mentioned as well, if you have the different strategies, there's another one called the Bayer Nash. And that is, um, so I'll just start with the DSIC. It means that truth telling is a weekly dominant strategy. So you fare best or at least not worst by being truthful, regardless of what the others do. In the DSIC mechanism, strategic considerations cannot help any agent achieve better outcomes than the truth, right? So that is a weekly dominant strategy. Now, there is a less weekly dominant strategy that can be related to what Tony said in terms of when you have more bad actors. So the less weekly dominant strategy is the Bayer Nash um, incentive compatible. And that is very similar to this, but it's um, this one, the DSIC is you fare best regardless of what the others do. Um, with the other one, with the Bayer Nash, you only fare best if the others are truthful, right? So with the DSIC, I mean, you can use the different ones for different purposes, but obviously in a network like AI Weave, you know, you're gonna get potentially people doing what they want with their nodes. So this, that is the team decided this is the best strategy to use, but just to con, pair and contrast that with a different strategy, a less dominant strategy, the Bayer Nash. And the Bayer Nash, if others act, um, so regardless of what the others do, so the others can act badly in the DSIC and there's still better outcome comes. But in the Bayer Nash, if others act badly, then a less better outcome will come. So that is what they're calling wildfire in AR weave. So the node that gossips preferentially to higher ranked peers, building off what Michael said about Genghis Khan in the village in Mongolia, people talking about the, the chief, the, the, the chief, if so the people gossiping, um, that's gonna uh, that's gonna spread and they're gonna become ranked higher. So the node then gossips preferentially to higher ranked peers. This allows the node to rationalize its bandwidth allocation Okay, and it also has the effect of promoting pro-social behavior on the part of nodes generally. But this is just a little um, a little peep from the yellow paper. The yellow paper goes into a lot more detail 
about wildfire and game theory in general, and it's quite interesting, actually. Yeah. So let's talk about the sustainable endowment now. So as I said, AI Weave is a combination of those four things just mentioned, block weave, proof of access, wildfire, and block shadowing. Now, in combination with a sustainable endowment. So an endowment is just something that pays out money, right? So the whole point of AI Weave as a project is you pay once and you store forever. That's what separates it from Sia. That's what separates it from Filecoin. That's what separates it from um, even ICP. I think in ICP, you have to pay on a monthly basis, I believe, right? This is what separates it from Dropbox. This is what separates it from AWS. These are all monthly subscriptions. With IPFS, you have Pinata, monthly subscription. So the only thing I really think AI Weave currently is in the league of its own. You pay once, you store forever, right? But in order to do that, they had to do some maths and they had to do some theory, right? So what's the infinite, um, you have to work out infinite time cost of storing a finite piece of data, right? So ultimately, when you pay once to store forever of your content on AI Weave, that payment is split into a direct payment to the miner, the person that just mined the current block, and it also goes, the majority of that payment then goes to the sustainable endowment. Now that sustainable endowment is just a pool of AR tokens, right? Which again, proposes- that to allow it to keep existing over a period of time. Yeah. Over 200 years. Facts, yeah. Ah, uh, now it makes sense, Ninja, because we were looking at this as a, as a potential solution for a project we're working on. And we was like, this is a bit expensive for one terabyte. But then when you think about it being one terabyte Whatever. over 200 years, yes. that's a bargain. Yeah, facts. Wait, Ninja, have you still got those numbers on what it is for one terabyte? Yes, I do. One second, if I just search for them, the answer is, I'll just find it one second. I think it was like six grand. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was like six thousand eight hundred dollars for one terabyte for two hundred plus years. Yeah. Mm. Was six thousand eight hundred divided by two hundred? Um, one second. One second. Six thousand eight hundred divided yeah. by two hundred is thirty-four. So it's thirty-four dollars a year. Thirty-four. Which is better than, that's better what, than drop one terabyte. That's yeah. a lot. Yeah, that, that's thirty-four pound a year is better than. Dropbox, better than AWS, we are paying five pounds a month. Dollars. So, yeah, yeah, it's like three dollars a month, really, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, so, this is definitely four whales, though. Because yeah, 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 yeah. Want to up from this cost? It's definitely more of a. It's not a, a a people's thing. It's more of a corporations thing. Yeah, it could even be used for marketing. I guess if you say, "Oh, this is stored for." ever 200 years it could be used for market purposes as well yeah. so it's useful all sorts of stuff like you're saying like even mirror xyz if you guys know mirror xyz so yeah so it's used for that they store their articles on it obviously that's via uh, uh ethereum and then i think it's stored uh, on a couple of different things but but ethereum uh, weave is one of them so it's used for all sorts of stuff yeah pianity yeah. Store, store theirs as well pianity the 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 music platform they store their stuff on on here which is amazing because then it's the smart contracts for the music yeah. are there forever which is crazy to think about it hmm. that's it so mirror xyz and pianity those are two um projects that use ai weave i mentioned them as well in a bit later on in projects um, but yeah, like I said earlier, so many projects you use AI Weave and it's like, really, it's really not even known that much in the, um, in the blockchain world. But the people who are using it know, and the people who are using it, they're like big in the game, as you might say. So it's um, interesting. And now it's important to note that this 200 years is a minimum, right? They, they've used 0 0.5. So they've assumed that technology is going to carry on increasing at the rate it has done, right? But they've used a 0.5% allowance. 
when based on historical data, they could have actually used a 20% allowance, right? So 0.5 to 20, I don't know if that's time 40. So really 200 times 40 based on what the world is doing now, that's how, lo that's how long infinity is. So two, it's important to note that 200 years, they've done their calculations really conservatively because they have to. So 200 years is like bare, bare minimum that what you pay once is gonna be stored for. So let's just go on to how they actually sum up that. So it's a bit of equation. So in order for them to work out a time cost of storing a finite piece of data, they first need to work out a price per gigabyte per hour of storing a piece of data. In order to do that, this is all in the yellow paper, by the way. Um, in order to do that, they need a hard disk, a current market HDD price. So what's the current price of a, let say the cheapest um, hard disk drive on the, on the market. Divide that by the capacity of that, times it by the mean time between failure, right? You get a price per gigabyte hour of data. Now, as I mentioned before, over the past 50 years, um, the average PGBH, the average price of storing a gigabyte for one hour on one hard drive has gone down by 30%, 30.57, I believe, we'll call it 30% per year. This right? graph is awesome. Mm. Anyone's listening to this on Apple Music, or, or Spotify or any audio platform, go to the YouTube video so you can watch these um, slides. This is a great graph. Carry on, my friend. Exactly. So the over the last 50 years, the average price, so the average price story, one gigabyte on one hard drive, right, um, has decreased by 30% per year, right? So what that is basically saying in, in normal terms is hard drives are getting smaller, but they're getting more capacity every year. But as we can see, if you look at 1950s computers like 2MB or 2KB, they're like massive things as big as Tony's bookshelf, right? So um, we that's basically, some people say Moore's law is dead, but historically Moore's law has been somebody you can track. So Moore's law um, relates to- the... Are you saying Moore's law is dead? You've been saying that? <laughs> Well, when I Google Moore's law, to be fair, I don't know if anybody's saying it, but when I Google Moore's law, it says it's dead came up. So maybe that's just, <laughs> maybe that's just some rubbish, but uh, Moore's law. it's been pretty accurate for a pretty long time. The thing is, I didn't even click on those articles that were saying it. I just I just had to put it out in the public domain. To be some fair, to be fair there is one thing that I did read that is gonna break all of Moore's law, which is the what's it called with um basically ai is gonna break it, it just mm. destroys more it just destroys it <laughs> on exponentially on yeah a, okay so it's still yeah so that just shows that this 0.5 um percent figure it just shows the amount that ai with team has been conservative in making these um calculations realistically like they've been that in fact, I can definitely confirm that because when you look at what's happening now with the chip creation, chip creation is now done by machine learning and by AI. So yeah. that's why they're getting to this. The, that's why chips are able to do what they can do now because they're not designed by humans anymore. Mad. So that's where, the, the, that's where literally the, this whole boom that's going to happen over the next five ten years in terms of bandwidth and capacity mm. people are like oh it's not going to be possible no it's, it's it's going to be possible because like the actual chip architecture now is insane and that's, that's one thing that i've been looking at because it's something elon musk kept, kept talking about is about chip architecture and uh just general architecture in, in in general and most people don't know it but if you look at the tesla Gigafactory is actually designed like a chip. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's mad. Wow, so we've got like robots, got AI creating more robots. Interesting. Mm. Um, yeah, so. If They're going to need more storage. Mm. Yeah, that's true. 
And yep, so these and these storage, the storage that we're having, it's gonna have more capacity. So the AI weave team, they based there, um, we pay one store forever on historical data and future trends, but they've been very conservative in that future trends. Now, considering what Michael just said, like the fact that they've been so conservative just means that it's not going to be at least 200 years. It's probably going to be pay one stuff for at least like 20,000 years, but they're just saying 200 years to cover themselves, right? So if you take a gradient of this, you can ask, extrapolate it to future. So uh, that's what this is here, essentially. So the price of storage, used, what we just worked out, the price of gigabyte hour, um, at a arbitrary point in time, times up by the data size, right? Here we've got PGBH. But I mean, I'm going into, I don't really have to go into this detail. It just makes me excited though, because I like a bit of maths. But um, the PGBH is there. Um, so we've got it, put an I, arbitrary time, times it by the data size, and then sum that up. From to infinity, essentially. Ah, uh, so wait, 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 wait. You've just you've just solved a big problem for us. So you enjoy this kind of maps because I hate this kind of math. <laughs> I mean, I do like because when I first looked at this stuff on the yellow paper, I felt tired and I had to go and sleep. Right. So when when I see equations, I just feel like oh. But then when I actually come back and I'm like, I want to understand it. Do you know what I mean? So I do like maths definitely. Okay, because we've got a massive equation problem that we need to to, to create and solve. So uh, remember how I was saying we need to get you involved in some projects. We couldn't. We'd, it would it would naturally emerge. Yeah, exactly. So, there we go. It's naturally emerged. Now we can give you loads of stuff to read, and then you can put it into an equation for us. That's it. So yeah, the universe is interesting. <laughs> so yeah, no coincidences. Perfect. No coincidences. So. We've got the price of storage here from time zero at one point in the past to a time in the future. And when you do the maths, um, I'm going to break down this sigma sign because I had to break it down for myself. So let's do, when I used to see this equation, this sigma sign here, I used to be, be scared of it. I'm like, what does it mean? But actually, let's say I equals one okay so that means we're starting from i equals one where we're going to end we're going to end at say um i equals five right so this is going to be five data sets right and this the thing you want to sum up so you put your logic or your equation in here so we're going to just put in i in here to keep it simple so this all what this means it looks a bit complicated maybe to not to some, but to me, when I used to see this, I'd be like, what does this mean? All it means is we start from, this is I. It's telling us what the lower bound of I is, one. This means sum. So it's always going to be addition, right? Add. But all it means is you just sum up this thing, that this function here. So what's after one? It's going to be two plus you always increase it by what's here. So you start with the bottom, you end with the top, you increase by what's here. It's gonna be three plus four plus five. So that's all that means. If I'm wrong, somebody correct me in the comments as well, right? But then what you do see, what looks a bit more complex sometimes is sometimes you will see, you will still see a- uh, Sigma sign. Yeah, you'll still get a sigma sign you'll still get a lower bound. So let's say lower bound is one. What you'll see sometimes, you'll just see a big equation here, right? All that means what we're doing with the I, you just, you'll have I in this equation. So you always substitute the I for one, do the equation plus number two, put it in here, right? So that's for the more complex stuff there. Um, and it'll have an N as well. Oh, well, you're giving out a mad game in this episode. <laughs> so let's put I again. So. Sometimes you will see it with an N. All that means is we're starting at one and we're going to N. N can be, they use N because you don't want to be writing out. If it's a thousand, you don't want to write this up to a thousand. You'll be there for a long time. So they just say N and then they can say one 
plus uh, two plus three, say, and then dot, 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 plus n. All right, so you can start off by just saying first or the first three if you like, and then dot, 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 n, right? So then you do certain maths with that, which I don't even know how to do. I can't lie, I, I did that at one point. If I was to do it, I'd have to learn again, but it's fascinating. So yeah, I just divulged there. So that's what this means. Let's go back. You're hired. <laughs> 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 right so that's all that means imagine this is the i data size times pgbh price per gigabyte hour see so it's got the i in it there right so this is imagine i zero so it's zero here right it's going to be plus this again but it's going to be one there all the way to infinity right so they've used this gradient here you can take a gradient they've used it to extrapolate essentially for use of a better word, to infinity. And from doing that, they get um, a price. Now this price is dependent on how much data you want to store. That's why the data size is in there. So I can't give one price. AI Weave doesn't give one price. Like you said earlier, you saw something where it cost like 6,000 pounds to store for, for how long? It depends on your data size, right? So this links, uh, transaction pricing is calculated as follows. This is what we just went through here. By how how big is your um, transaction, right? So the size of your data that you want to start on AI with, that's the transaction cost, right? So I said there's two payments. So when you pay once, it's split into two payments. One payment goes directly to whoever's mining that new block and one payment goes to the endowment, right? So this TX cost here, is what goes to the endowment, right? So look at this total, what you pay once, stuff ever, is made up of TX cost, what goes to the endowment, and TX reward, what goes straight to the miner that just mined the new block. Now, the TX reward is just the TX cost times some factor. This factor could be less than one to make it smaller, or it could be more than one to, to make it bigger, but it's probably gonna be less than one, I presume if what's going to the sustainable endowment is always going to be more, but I don't know what this factor is here. So I just thought I'd break that down a bit. Um, but if you go in the yellow paper there, it's going to explain it much better than me. Uh, okay, so we've gone through what AR weave is essentially. It's those four things mentioned. It's the block weave plus the uh, wildfire game theory plus proof of access, plus block shadowing, a new sharding method. Plus, we just looked at the sustainable endowment that's gonna allow it to run in the long term, right? So now we have the AR weave. So what do we do with it? So we're building a new web. So it's called the perma web. Anything on AR weave is part of the perma web. But it's not to the extent where now we need to, to, to use something completely new. It's not like we're ditching the old it's web. It's called the perma web because it's the permanent web. It's the yeah, web. Exactly. It's exactly. So it's not like we have to uninstall Windows and start to use Linux because that would be long. So the perma web, it just integrates with normal web, right? But it's just a new web built into existing framework, right? So the array of data, websites, and decentralized applications hosted on the block weave is accessible on normal web, not normal web browsers. So as I said at the beginning, um, you don't even need to use an extension now. You can just go, I believe, straight on and type in your URL and you're going to be on the perma web. To be fair, you might even be on the perma web and not even know it. If you're using Pianity, if you're using um, Mary XYZ, you're on the perma web and you don't even know it. So it's just integrated already, right? So because the AI Weave network itself is built on top of HTTP, the protocol from which the traditional web arises, browsers have access to all of the data stored in the network so as i just said it's already integrated http api um you just link in with that right so now building on the perma web as i just said ai we've has a http API. 
So if you want to know more about that, you can click on there. It's a whole leap of information on integration with HTTP, which makes it seamless. Developers can use familiar web technologies, including HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and deploy to the perma web in minutes. Right. Now, from my understanding, um, downloading from the perma web is quick, but uploading can take a bit of time. But we've actually got different solutions for that. Um, I'll talk about one of the solutions in another slide, because I forgot its name as of the moment. Once published, a perma web app cannot be unpublished. All right, so that's something to think about. I remember at school, um, well, I don't know if it happened, but say some people have, like say, pictures put up of them on the internet that they didn't want, right? Then the school would get involved, the police would get involved, the, the, the local web servers would get involved and then they could take it down, right? So with AI Weave, as they say, go on your bed. You can't do that with AI Weave. It's there forever, right? However, nodes can choose what data they accept, store and share, which is called democratic content policy. So if you get enough nodes actually agreeing on what they wanna share, then what they wanna block is gonna be limited. So you're gonna have limited access as a user of AI Weave to certain content that is agreed on unanimously to actually um to, to to censor that content so there is a way of censorship on ai weave um however still whatever you put on there is going to be on there forever um but they had to i presume integrate this just because there are certain things that if you want you have the right to, to try and get it removed as well yeah just for the record it yeah. is, is is that connect correct pronunciation ar weave I don't know. I've always called it Arweave. I've Maybe. always called it Arweave. <laughs> call it Arweave. All right, call it Arweave. So, but I just said something. I think I made a mistake. I said it gets deleted. It doesn't get deleted. You can only um, control your node, the, the, the content that your node wants to take on itself. You can only control that. So in, if enough nodes say we don't want to have this content, then, okay, it's going to be kind of rare in the network, right? because nodes are collaborating and not having it, but you cannot just delete something from AI. Once it's published, it can't be unpublished, it's there forever. But this actually uh, runs into another risk, which I'll talk about in a bit. The risk is China. Apparently over 50% of nodes are in China, which would actually mean that the CCP now can control which content is on AI. We've, but that's a whole other discussion, All right? So, uh ai weave sorry i weave they have a open web foundry so as it's a new um uh, project well 2017 um they're doing their best or historically they've been doing their best in order to um promote usage promote use of their block weave promote use of their technology so they have an open web foundry in which they invest time um resources and money into any project that wants to develop on the AR weave, right? And we can see some projects there, some of the alumni, some projects that either they've approached AR weave or collaborated with and got that support in order to build on AR weave. We can see does this, come, of, does this come from their does this come from their endowment fund? Oof, that's a good question. Because uh, I would assume so, right? I don't think it does, you know. That's a really good question, though. I'll have to find that out. Because sustainability comes in two different forms, right? When you think mm -hmm. about blockchains or governance protocols, right? You can break it down really easily. Mm -hmm. um, it's like one of the essential properties that you cannot miss mm -hmm. um, in the sustainability. You break it down to development and participation sustainability. Mm -hmm. So participation is like the miners, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you need to incentivize them to mine the blocks. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then you need development participation. And that's what you're talking about there. Like they have to account for that some reason. So I, I'm guessing it comes from there, right? But I mean, where else would they get it from? That's a really good point. Um, I'm actually going to find that out because uh, I don't know. Not a matter, not like, I don't think it's world ending, but I would say that's like something that you'd want to think about. Yeah, no, definitely. Where does uh, money or open?
Yeah, because yeah. So yeah, the money, where does it come from? I don't know. Um, I, I have a feeling it doesn't come from the sustainable endowment, but I can't say why I have that feeling. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. so yep, as I said, some projects here, AI drive, um, competing with Dropbox, um, competing with even another project. We're not competing, you can say. Um well, you could say competing, but there's another project on the um there's another project on the AR weave that's called Accord. And Accord is also a similar project to AI Drive. So they're two projects that are really tackling the storage on AI weave. Pianity, uh, music NFTs, Kive. Kive is the um the project that's built using AI Weave that allows upload speed to AI Weave to be quicker. And it allows interpolarity with other blockchains as well. There's a permabot. This is used to save tweets and other posts from social media. There's ArcLight. This is also dealing with music. Um, this is imagine that you can upload your whole album, your whole songs to the permaweeb, from to the permaweb through ArcLight. There's a mail app. There is WorkerDAO. Um, I couldn't find too much about WorkerDAO. Um, do you know anything about that, Tony? I don't know WorkerDAO personally, but I'm assuming that's just a, a pro- like a protocol for sourcing workers or like front end, back ends. I'm I'm going to take a stab, but yeah. I've not had interactions with them myself. Right, because when I searched for WorkerDAO, um, I couldn't actually find it, but I, I found something called WorkDAO. So mm. I don't know if that's a completely different project. But anyway, these are just some projects that have been through the Open Web Foundry. Okay, and Accord, so I mentioned Accord before. Accord will rival Dropbox and Google Drive, typical Web2 solutions. And it's like AI Drive as well. It's allowing storage on the PermaWeb. They went through a period where they allowed free permanent storage of up to 500 MB, but I think that was, um, I don't think that offer is available anymore. It might be, but I don't think it is. So Bundler. AI with base bundler raises 5.2 million to boost decentralized storage. Um, so when I said, when I mentioned Kive, I might have got that confused with Bundler because Bundler aims to scale AI weave, allowing for near instant transaction finality. So I don't know if Kive are doing the same thing or something different, right? And at the current moment, over 90% of data is uploaded to AI with using Bundler. So as I was saying before, um, it's quite fine, quite easy to, to pull your data from AI with, but uploaded natively to AI with, it can be quite slow. So Bundler have come along and they've solved that issue now. And as a result, over 90% of data is uploaded to AI with through Bundler. Okay, Magic Eden. So Magic Eden is a NFT store on Solana. It raised $130 million in this so-called um, bear market, right? So now it's hit Unicall status at $1.6 billion valuation. So this is a NFT store on Solana. And when you go onto there and look at NFTs, this is a screenshot from one of their collections. It says, minted on the Solana network and permanently and immutably stored on the AI Weave blockchain forever. So now there is um, a lot more people are learning about IPFS now. They're learning about metadata, smart contract. People are realizing actually when they buy the NFT from um, OpenSea, actually. Actually, you know, that metadata of the NFT is just linking to somewhere and 50% of the time that link is stored on Amazon Web service or somewhere and it can just be taken down if somebody doesn't renew their fees. Yeah. Tip tip there is like scroll down on the left. You've got to check where it's stored. It's it's there to look at, but you've you've got to make sure that it says Ethereum. 
That's it, right? It tells you, it'll say centralized or Ethereum or well. This is the thing, this is the thing guys. We've, we realized this is the thing that made me realize how early you are. You got to think the amount of people that are buying NFTs that don't even know ETH scanner exists. That's wild. So. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when you said this on the game, you said, don't buy it. Can, can you just say them bars again, please? Don't buy NFTs if you don't know how to use ETH scanner. But you've got to realize, like, that's how early we are. We're so early. It's ridiculous. Like, people think that NFTs, have, yes, they've generated the amount of money they have. But people think that they're mainstream now. Yes, we've got these massive brands and corporations. And people think that blockchain is, is mainstream. It's not. It's nowhere near it because, like, what percent of the population can use EVSCAN? I would argue it's 0.001%, probably less than that. Yeah, interesting. And that, that is true. I do see um, it becoming more mainstream now as in terms of the knowledge base people are realising because there's been a few articles XYZ has bought this NFT and it's disappeared. So I do see more people realizing now, but yeah, it's definitely the majority of people probably still don't, but don't know, which is. I mean, probably don't have to refresh on that day either in that case. Wait, but... people haven't got <laughs> Scoobies. <laughs> yeah, we've got Scoobies. But it's all infrastructure right now, right? We're seeing like real use cases starting to leak out. Like you guys, you heard of like. Um... Like Gary V does his like VCon, so there's like a real use case tickets, yeah, um, and, and things like that. You got like Flyfish Club, that's like NFTs are your ticket to an exclusive sushi amakaze like yeah, yeah, uh, yeah restaurant. Yeah, yeah. And so you're seeing like real gateway use- stuff with Shopify as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're seeing actual use cases come out. You know, yeah. super early, man. Just like not even touched it. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so let's talk a bit about IPFS as it's relevant. So IPFS um, was created by the Open Web Foundry in 2014. Jeez. Now it's important to note this slide that- is hard. Sorry? This slide is hard, bro. <laughs> I respect. It's important, right? And it just links on for what we're saying. Um, so IPFS 2014 by the Open Web Foundry. It's important to know that the Open Web Foundry also create, are the creators of Filecoin. So Filecoin, which is, you could say, it's a competitor to, 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 to AR Weave, but really when you look under the surface, they're doing two completely different things. Filecoin is like, um, it's like, it's a Dropbox, you pay a monthly fee, Amazon Warehouse, sorry, Amazon work, web services, you pay a monthly fee, whereas AR Weave, you pay once, store forever. So two different use cases for two different types of people, right? So, um, IPFS and Filecoin are under the same entity, so therefore they're working together, right? IPFS, interplanetary file system. So as we just were saying, in context of NFTs, many not knowing only the link pointer is being stored and not the actual file, right? So IPFS is actually an early decentralized way of storing documents through the internet. So it's, it's great, actually. Um, typically with um, the HTTP, when you type in your HTTP bar, you're accessing something and you're being sent to a centralized server. And then you will be served that content from that centralized server. If that centralized server goes down, historically, typically with HTTP, you cannot access that website or that content you want to download. With IPFS now, that content is split up between nodes. So if one of those nodes goes down, you can access your content on different nodes. So IPFS is actually great and is decentralizing the internet, right? Yeah, and it's currently being used heavily. Um, as we can see on this um, image of, so this image shows current um, state of NFTs. It shows where the metadata of NFTs currently is being stored. So 50% of metadata of NFTs are currently being stored in centralized place, places. Wow. 
So that would be your metadata for your NFTs being stored in Amazon Web Server or somewhere like that. It's being, if the guy starts paying for his monthly subscription, you'll <laughs> go under your bed. <laughs> you lost your NFT. <laughs> Oh, man. So, yeah, you lost your NFT if, um, if that happens, right? So the centralized 50%. So it's interesting to know that IPFS and IPFS gateways occupies around 40%. So that's what I meant by, I think, the knowledge base is becoming more known now. Uh, and IPFS is actually increasing its market share of being used with NFTs because at the Thank state of this... So I think that's a really important uh, point, Ash. Like, for instance, people think that like that's more decentralized than they think they are. So, for Ethereum, for example, like a lot of people, they contact like ETH the network through mm. a provider, right? So most people go through MetaMask. MetaMask will go through Infera, oh. which is a centralized provider. You're interfacing with the provider, so it's centralized, right? Yeah, yeah. So like. If you know about this stuff and you think it's important, then that's something that you might want to think about. So like rather than going through, in like MetaMask is great. It's just like a, a thing, right? It's an entity. Yeah. But like you want to switch your RPC, for, for example, from something to Alchemy, which is more decentralized. You can have your own node or you can run your own ETH node if you're like, you know, like minted, you want to buy 32 ETH and crack on. But that's like another way to support Hola. decentralization. <laughs> Bola. <laughs> that's fucking right, man. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say. That's interesting. Yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah, so IPFS, that's just straight up using, um, in order to use IPFS, uh, you, you have to download something onto your computer and then you become a gateway, essentially, right? Um, IPFS gateway is where you go, but you don't have it and you interact through somebody that does have it or a company that has it and then you can access everything on IPFS. But to sum it up, you can, for the purpose of this image, it's all using the IPFS technology. So you can say 40% of NFTs metadata is currently being stored using IPFS. Um, it's interesting to know also that, like, like I said before, Sam Williams, um, like I could tell that he's doing it. Or I believe that he's doing it for the right reasons, you know, he's, because he's collaborated with a guy from um, Open Web Foundry, Wayback Machine, now AI we've actually have an IPFS gateway connection. So you can actually use um, AI weave to interact with IPFS. So it's not like he said, okay, we're competitors with IPFS. We're gonna go our own separate way. It's like, no, he's realized that in order to get a permanent future in terms of web content, you know, it's gonna not just be one solution, it's not just gonna be IPFS or ICP internet computer or AI weave. It's gonna be, you know, Going to take the skills of everybody in order to do that so ai we've actually have a ipfs um gateway that you can use that's interesting to know as well so ai we've so are we so you could be coming underneath this ipfs 18 percent gateway right so that's an interesting point to make or it could be in the on chain or it could be on the unknown as well so that's going to read this out. Purchases of NFTs are supported by buying an immutable permanent object. However, those files are rarely stored on chain. Doing so would be prohibitively expensive for most NFT projects. Instead, smart contracts for NFTs typically store the actual content in a simple token URI, which points to an internet address where the digital object actually resides. And a key word from this paragraph is rarely stored on chain, right? Because even IPFS is not stored on chain, right? which make it on chain is 4.5%, right? So IPFS has dangers as well, right? With IPFS and Filecoin, IPFS is the technology that's allowing Filecoin to have a utility. With IPFS, you are essentially storing the document locally on your hard drive. So any spare hard, that hard drive space you have, you're storing the document on there and then since IPFS comes from Open Web Foundry, which also are the creators of Filecoin, you are paid in Filecoin for actually um, releasing that data or that content when somebody queries your server and asks for that exact same content, right? 
So when I say on chain, IPFS is not stored on chain. You have to use the spare hard disk drive um, of a node around the world to store the actual content. Now, AI weave, the blockchain, the block weave is actually also stored on the hard disk space as well. However, with AI weave, the actual data is within the transaction. So AI wave is literally on chain in the sense that in your block, you have a list of transactions. Now in those transactions is actual data, right? So with IPFS, you're just running, um, sorry, you're not running, you're actually just having those files on your hard disk space. So, I mean, I could break that down in, in a different way, um, but I think that should suffice. I don't think that was a great explanation, but um, let's go on to IPFS dangers. So with IPFS, there is catch. If you clear your catch, you can actually get rid of the files. So if somebody's hosting a file and they've cleared their catch, then you can't access that data no more. Therefore, the file needs to be pinned, right? Long. But that's it. So there's a service called Pinata, which is an IPFS pinner, which goes back to the subscription service again. If somebody doesn't pay for that Pinata subscription, you're thinking you're safe using IPFS, but they've not paid for the Pinata subscription. You've lost your NFT because it's not being stored, right? So that's where um, Filecoin is coming. You're, you're paying for a fixed time. So with Filecoin, there is a contract between the person that's hosting your content with IPFS on their hard, on their hard drive. And after that period ends, again, they don't have to renew that contract. They, your file could just be gone again. So there is dangers with IPFS. Um, however, it is a, it is a great um, step up from the Web2 um, centralized gateway servers. Um, yeah, I hope I didn't. Uh, I, have a, I have a question though. Like, yeah. is, if you've purchased an MS, uh, a um, an NFT, right? Yep. And you've successfully interfaced through whatever provider with, let's say, the ETH uh, network. Mm -hmm. Once that's been put through and it's mined or currently mined within the block, anyway, uh, merge incoming. But like, it's it's within there. Yeah, that's that, that's then on chain, and that's that is yours because it's it's permanently stored on chain. Um, is that right? But your mm -hmm. where's where's the difference coming from there? So I think I understand your question, but can you ask it again? So so you're saying like you know, Pinata for example, like they they flip it and and it's gone, right? Uh, yep. They flip the switch and it's gone. Yep. But I was I was just thinking, obviously, if you're NFT is on the ETH network, right? So mm -hmm. you go on your, your OpenSea, you see that it's on the ETH network. Yeah. You purchase that NFT or transfer it. Yeah. Um, it's done within whichever block. The block is mined and put through. Mm -hmm. um, then technically that's attached to your account now. So like, even though you couldn't access it, mm -hmm. like if the provider went down, it's still on the ETH blockchain, right? Does yeah. that make sense? So, so at what point does this, is this like the, the, is this the problem between the two, like the space right, between the two? Between you question. and yeah, So you, you have your link, you have your smart contract. The NFT can be um, seen as of being a smart contract and the metadata. Correct. Right. So that metadata it has a link to somewhere else, right? The metadata might have a link to where it's being pinned by IPFS. So if the guy don't pay for his Panata service, yeah, it's gone down. But you still have the smart contract denoting that you own it. Right? Which exists on the blockchain. Which exists on the blockchain. Right. right. But say with AR Weave, that smart contract on the blockchain is your actual data. That's the difference. I see. I see. It's the actual image. So you don't need that over half Panata IPFS. That's the main so, difference. So it cuts out the provider, right? Mm. I just need you to clarify that for my small brain. Yeah, I was simple, getting, simple words. I was trying to explain it earlier, but I realized I wasn't explaining it well. I understand now. Cool. That's the main difference. Yeah. 
and IPFS is um, so it is a step forward, and it will still be worked on. It's working in conjunction with Filecoin, but at the end of the day, with IPFS, when that node or if that node goes down, you still lose access, right? So that is the main difference. Uh, so let's look at NFT slash in-game assets on AR Weave. So an in-game asset um, is essentially an NFT. It denotes ownership within the ecosystem or within a game, right? So as mentioned earlier, there's Magic Eden. That's a NFT um, store on Solana. We have Manifold. So many of the most expensive NFTs ever bought and sold were made by Manifold. Um, Jay-Z did his um, NFT on Manifold. Now, Manifold is an interesting one. It actually allows you to install an app into your NFT, right? And by the way, everything on this page uses AR Weave, right? So AR Weave is like being used, like, and Jay-Z knows about AR Weave. He, he chose to put his NFT on Manifold, which uses AR Weave. So he would definitely have known about the permanence of his NFT. He would have done his research, I presume, right? So Manifold, um, yeah, it allows you to um, actually program your NFT beyond just visual and audio NFTs. Right. Metaplex, another um, NFT um, platform on Solana, which uses AR Weave. So Metaplex is, it allows you to have like a storefront. Imagine like a web free Shopify. It allows you to actually host a storefront um, to sell your NFT on. So that's doing something unique there as well. Mintbase were one of the first NFT marketplaces to use AR Weave. They use it for the NFT and metadata, right? And actually they received a grant from AR Weave um, to a few years back now to start moving the NFT metadata and images to um, AR Weave's hybrid blockchain, right? So this was when AR Weave was still testing and it was still a hybrid blockchain. And that actually goes back just to the point Tony was making. So Mintbase received a grant from the AR Weave project to start moving the NFT metadata and images, right? So their metadata, something that points to the image, as well as the images, are all on the AR Weave blockchain. So it's there forever, both, whichever way you cut it, it's there. So that's interesting. And that's on the near protocol blockchain. Pianity music NFTs, as um, Michael mentioned earlier, is used as an AR weave. And Mirror XYZ, as Tony mentioned earlier, uh, very unique as well. Text slash blog articles as NFTs. Right. So I just want to show this is the Jay Z NFT. And I'm showing this just to show that. AR Weave is actually in the public domain now. It's not just, say, some crypto dons, some crypto degans that are knowing about AI Weave. It's Silverbiz, this website, where the NFT was um, auctioned off on, is like a very, very, very top, well-known auction site around the world. Yeah. And if you go on their website, and if you look at Jay-Z's um, NFT, that was auctioned off on there. And if you go and read the information, it says this, it says the permanence of this NFT is rated excellent. The metadata associated with this NFT is higher than current industry standards. The metadata is stored within the smart contract, right? So that's the transaction in the block, the metadata. And within the metadata is stored within the smart contract and meets all standards within the e from improvement proposals adopted by all NFT platforms. It says the metadata associated with this NFT is stored on AR Weave, the most robust decentralized file storage system. So this is literally on like one of the best well-renowned known auction sites in the world. They're literally talking about AR Weave, right? And what it doesn't say on here, it only says that the metadata with the NFT is on, um, is stored on a smart contract. But as the website that they would have used, Manifold, actually uses AI Weave, the media is going to be on AI Weave as well. 
So it doesn't mention that, but the actual image is going to be on AI Weave as a transaction in the block. Right. So this is just some more, um, yep, some more, uh, some more projects on the AI Weave ecosystem. So we've nearly finished now, coming to an end. I'm just doing some more projects. Uh, it's quite a lot of projects. This is just some, this is not all. Uh, a card, mentioned a card, mentioned AI Drive. Um, Permaswap mentioned that. I believe Kive, uh, Bundler. Um, the card again. So yeah, this is just some projects being built. It's not exhaust, it's not an extensive or exhaustive list. Penalty. All right. And this eagle's gonna be on there, I bet yeah. Uh what project? I'm gonna I bet you there's gonna be a whole section just for legal 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 documents soon. Mm. I bet okay, yeah. yeah. Probably be sitting under like somewhere under like publishing or like DAO tooling or something like that. Yeah. Probably publishing, I reckon. Yeah. So there is so much out there for AI weave, so much being built on AI weave. It's actually amazing. Um, this was made by Accord, so shout out to Accord. Um, I took this from the Telegram group. Um, I forgot the guy's name, but I, he works with Accord. Uh, okay, so AI with partnerships. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a few Magic Eden and um, another one I mentioned, NFT platform being built on Solana. Uh, this is a quote directly from a co-founder of Solana. He essentially is talking about AI Weave here, even though he doesn't say it, but he was talking about AI Weave. So it doesn't make sense to build a dedicated storage network and force that burden on validators when a perfectly amazing solution already exists and is more economically rational than anything we could build. So that's the co-founder of Solana Labs talking about using AI Weave. And I know Solana quite actively essentially promote AI Weave, in a way. And AI Weave has already partnered with Solana, Cosmos, Polkadot, Alf, Avalanche, Near, and Scale. So on all these blockchains, there is um, the apps, decentralized apps uh, being built using AI Weave and Bundler, programs like Bundler make that easier to do now um, as it allows interpolarity between blockchains. All right. So let's look at one risk. Um, when I was looking for some risks of this project, um, this is something I kept coming across um, con quite con consistently. Um, the profitability for nodes to keep files online in case of AR price drop. So long-term storage economics if AR price significantly declines. So as mentioned earlier, when you pay once, store forever, um, you're paying a portion of that directly to the guy or the woman that just mined the node or the computer. But the majority of that goes to the endowment, which is paid out over time for the next say, 200 years at least. Right, so say there's a massive price drop in AR weave, how would um, miners be insensitized to keep on um, upholding the AI weave network on their hard drive? right on their on their computers especially as there is no requirement for joining and no penalty for leaving so when reading the the white paper as well the white paper assumes a stable token price in fiat terms right whereas we know cryptocurrency can be very um unstable at times so if there is a massive AI price drop um what would be the implication of that? Would if it doesn't become profitable, will people start turning off their nodes then? And then surely that's just going to lead to less recall blocks being had, therefore less ability to reclaim data. Um, now, implications of consolidation of block weave in larger nodes. So just as I said. Say it becomes unprofitable to mine, 
And these larger nodes, by the way, which have more of the recall block, meaning that they get to mine more new blocks because it's essentially proof of work. So with proof of work, the more mining power that you have, the more chance that you get to mine, um, or your computer will do the equation, which gives the new block first. So the more computing power you have, the more new blocks you can mine. With AR weave, the more computing power you have, the more recall blocks you have, which essentially means the more random data as transactions you are storing from the network. So now if those start to show off, then uh, it's gonna be less recall blocks in the network. Again, potentially um, proving a threat to the, all the data that's being stored on the network. Now I'm sure there's this easy answer to this. So if somebody knows, I would love for them to just tell me. Drop. There's 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 not a too much of an easy answer there. It's it's inherently a risk um, for proof of work. So mm -hmm. Bitcoin is exposed to the same risk. It's it's called economic security. So if there is less and less incentives mm -hmm. for miners to uphold the network, um, the economic economic security lowers. So it's oftentimes it's uh, are they profitable enough to afford um, the equipment and the power to run it? Um, if not, then mine is shut down and, and that's a big issue. So proof of work it has just this inherent risk tied mm. and into it, unfortunately. So, yeah. I mean, if someone solves it, you'll be pretty rich. But, <laughs> yeah, All that's right. what I'd say. Yeah, thank you for, for that. Okay, and then that moves on to the next point which is China. So over from my research, I kept finding that over 50% of AI, we know that in China, maybe I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, um, maybe someone dropped that in the comments. Damn. Um, but this would pose a massive threat to this project because of this democratic content policy. It doesn't matter. China could literally own more than 50% and shut off all those nodes in China, the AI weave network would still be fine because of the rest of the world. But the threat doesn't lie in just shutting off the nodes. The threat lies in the Chinese government actually enforcing a democratic content policy. And then since they are all more than 51% of the mining power, they would get to then choose which, which nodes have which blacklist and they could feel this way, they could actually censor what is being permanently stored on the AI weave network. Right. And I know they're smart um, Chinese government, so it's probably not a coincidence that over 50% at this early game, this, this, this early in the, in the game, that over 50% of AI weave nodes are in China. I don't think that's a coincidence. So, yeah, is AI weave less blockable than current centralized solutions? What, does, what AI weave does is valuable, but in countries such as China or Russia, the main way of censoring is often tied blocking the website. Do, do, do. Mm. So, yeah. is can i can i ask is is are we open source is are we open source uh i believe so but i can't answer Maybe. that with certainty it's one of the ways to to um guard against a 51 percent attack is to be yeah. fork friendly uh -huh. so it's something that ethereum featured is something that bitcoin is so also featured it comes back to what i talked about before uh -huh. earlier in the in the video is um is bitcoin cash and eth classic is like they're fork friendly so if someone 51 cents you as long as all the clients and community decide i mean there'll be a split um to move you hard fork um mm -hmm. so basically the network divides um so that's how you kind of mm -hmm. mitigate that risk if it's super fork friendly that what's the point mm -hmm. um if you've got a really solid um, community, bunch of investors or companies, et cetera, they will choose one network over the other. And mm. so it's, it's, it's not economically viable to attack the network with the 51%. Mm. But it wouldn't be a, a standard 51% attack in terms of AI weave, right? The, the goal is to, to start data. So it wouldn't mm -hmm. be a 51% attack, but it would be more the Chinese government or say any other I'll stop attacking the Chinese government, but it would be any other. <laughs> <laughs> it would be any right. other way using this democratic content policy, right? Right. So, but as long as, as long as they have the recall blocks, yeah. um, then and a decentral, an adequately decentralized network, yeah, you you can fork that data. That's true. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. But interesting risk. 
Yeah, definitely. And this is me in the uh in the in Telegram group just asking questions, man. A really, really helpful community. Uh mm. okay. So risk free as the network grows, there is no guarantee that an arbitrary piece of data will be replicated in a node, especially if new nodes that onboard onto the network do not choose the optional full weave history download and only sync to the current block transaction. So this kind of relates, semi-relates to the last point. Um, there's no guarantee that your data is replicated. It's just rational that someone should want to have your data through the recall block. If no, if the one node that has your data disappears, right? So um, it's, compare this to, I should have put an F here, Filecoin's proof of space time system. So on Filecoin, there is a proof of space time system, which means that there's proofs running automatically every 24 hours that are verifiably posted on chain. So that means essentially Filecoin system is checking that a set piece of data is being stored every 24 hours, right? Now with AI Weave, historically in their proof of access, they didn't have this. It was just being assumed that the, the data was being stored. But since then, since last year, actually, they've changed from proof of access to random succinct proof of access. So really I'm answering my own question in this risk. They've identified this risk and they've actually implemented some similar to Filecoin's proof of space time. They've now implemented succinct random access proofs, which is somewhat similar to that, which Filecoin does is every certain amount of time, it will just check all the nodes and it will check that um, the data is being stored. Um, so the risk even so before they introduced this, the risk was never that high as well. I took this from some AI weave documentation. At the time this graph was made, uh, we were on this blue box here. So it's basically um, showing the amount of nodes. At that time there was over 350 nodes and it's showing you the percent chance that data wouldn't be stored on the network. And these are minuscule numbers. These, um, when it says E to the minus, like that's very, very small. So really I identified this as a risk, but the way it's set up is not really that much of a risk. And especially now, since they, since last year, they moved to a, a more advanced version of uh, proof of assets, which is succinct proof of random access. So, yep, since Feb 26, 2021, um, AI Weave is now using succinct proof of random access. And to answer Tony's question, I don't think it's open source, not as of last year anyway, because they've actually implemented something new. So to do that, it needs to be controlled, I believe. Um, yep, so the last thing I'm gonna ask is what happens after 200 plus years? So, AI, we've said that pay once, have your data stored for at least 200 years. As mentioned earlier, that was very, very a overly conservative estimate by the AI with team. They used the 0.5% um, constant when they could have used like, you could have increased it up to 20% leverage, right? So they've gone for the smallest, smallest figure and they've come out with 200 years. So they've actually said, or Sam has said in documentation, well, after 200 years, the way that technology is um, evolving now, there's going to be probably a new solution. And that new solution is just going to incorporate everything that AI Weave has done into it, right? So it doesn't negate AI Weave. It still means what AI Weave is doing is important now. But in the future, when technology advances even more, there's going to be someone new come along. And just like we grab some data now and just insert it in the memory stick. It's going to do that with the whole of AI Weave. It's going to take everything and just insert that into there. So that's what they have said on that. So yeah, so that ends this presentation. Um, if anybody's got anything they want to add in as well before we finish up. Amazing. Yeah, that, was, that was great. World class. That was world class. Oh, thank you. thank you. I love the fact that I, I'm going to be honest, right? In all my time doing research, 
I have never thought, like, if I can't get an answer to something, I probably just accept that it is what it is. You went and asked the community for specific answers that you couldn't find. <laughs> mm. um, now, you're a real community hacker. Um, that was so much more than I expected. Um, <laughs> I thought we'd be, in it, we'd be here for an hour, um, not two, but yeah, that was very, very deep. I, 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 I need to myself, um, just because I've had a super long day myself, we take this in. Um, but I feel like you said everything that anyone within reason would need to know with regards to our weave or AR weave, whatever it's called. Um, now that we know we have an expert in our weave in our camp, one, we can get you to do a lot of the maths. And uh, now you can be our official decentralized file storage expert. I need to improve on the maths, man. But yeah, no, definitely. It's a... Man. I'm always willing to learn, man. So, yeah. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Yeah, man. Great episode. Uh, I'm going to have to shoot off. Uh, but let's, yeah. Um, yeah, let me just stop the recording. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching.